It also clearly defined our mission. So a million is what we got to hit. Ten years. Ten years. Ten years a million. So that's where we're at now. And it really underscores one of our themes today, which is this whole idea we started the morning with about scaling up. How do we learn from traditional digitization processes? Can we learn something from them for how to do this faster, better, and cheaper so we can actually hit those one million so Saul's kids do not have to stare into a depriving future but can have a rich, rich life and experiment with our objects. So that is a worthy goal, and I'm really glad that Saul hit that note and sort of brought us back to focusing on that at the very end. It's very clear to me at the end of the day here, the whole trajectory we've had today that, you know, this is clearly not the end. This is clearly just barely the beginning um, for all the activities we have going in terms of 3D experimenting with how we can actually engage our audiences with it. All the great stories we've heard both from Saul and the panel beforehand about what what has worked in schools, what has worked in a museum setting in terms of engaging people and what folks are experimenting there. Clearly, we don't have all the answers, but we're playing. We're being playful Saul, so we get credit for that. And that is a beautiful and a great, great thing. Um, Faraby and I are up here to very briefly, before we end the conference, um, tell you about a couple of things. I want to tell you a little bit, just looking ahead, what's next for us in terms of 3D digitization at the Smithsonian. Um, these are not hard and fast plans. These are more like, you know, sketches of things we probably will get to do. Uh, one of the things that will definitely happen is uh, the, the team will head down to historic Jamestown on Monday. They are not taking a break here. They're probably going back and packing up pretty soon. Uh, after we get done here, get all the gear down there. And they're going to do some documentation of excavations of 17th century graves there uh, with some of our natural history scientists who are down there uh, digging around in the dirt, in the hallowed dirt, I should say. Um, another thing we might get to do, and this is a might, um, some of you may know that the Carnegie Mansion uh, that the Cooper Hewitt Museum, National Design Museum is in, is getting renovated right now. It's closed, it's getting renovated. And there will be this tiny, tiny moment in time when this huge mansion will be completely empty and completely renovated. And if we can get some 3D scanners into that building in that tiny, tiny moment in time, it would be a beautiful thing and we could document the interior of that very, very unique building. So that'd be grand. Another plan um, that seems pretty likely to come through is uh, for the team to travel down to uh, Peru to document some archaeological sites along the Inca Trail, that's for an exhibit at the National Museum of the American Indian in 2015. That's another exciting prospect and a nice trip to go on. Um, what have I left out? Um, you may have heard that Richard Curin just published a book, uh, The History of America in 101 Smithsonian Objects or something like that. I think I jumbled the title slightly. Okay. Richard <laughs> will forgive me, I hope. Um, and that could be a blueprint for what we do next until we figure out how to scale this massively up uh, beyond you know, doing dozens of things to doing hundreds, thousands, and the millions that we got asked for today. <laughs> um, so that might be a, a good way to engage for us next, uh, a good way for us, a blueprint to follow, to pick the next objects we focus on and we put up in the 3D Explorer we launched yesterday. But the thing we're probably the most excited about is to give 3D digitization at the Smithsonian a true home base on the National Mall. And that's why I asked Faraby to share the stage with me for this last little bit to tell you a little bit about the plans we have for the Arts and Industries Building, the original Smithsonian Museum that is currently being renovated and how 3D figures into that. Great. Fair Thank week. you, Gunter. I think we win the prize for the most unusual names on the stage at the same time. Um, <laughs> yes. So thank you so much again for, for letting me be part of this conference. And I do want to share with you a bit of um, a vision that we have for, for what we can do with the Arts and Industries Building, which is a beautiful old building. It's actually a National Historic Landmark. It was the Smithsonian's first museum, uh, and it opened in 1881. Uh, it's been closed for the last 10 years, and if you walked by it on your way here today, you saw that there was quite a bit of scaffolding on the outside, some of which starts coming down this week. 
we have a chance to do something very special and very different with the inside of this building. Congress has some potential permanent plans for that building. Um, we don't get involved in telling Congress what to do, and I think we all know that that's probably not worth our time. Um, but they uh, have told us that they have a potential future use for that space, but we'll probably have between seven and 10 years in there where we can do something really experimental, where we can take this historic shell and create really a pop-up experience inside of it and use it as a way to engage with our audiences in a completely different way than we've had the chance to do in the past. So the goal that we have for this building is in late 2014, hopefully, to reopen that building as the Smithsonian Innovation Space creating an opportunity in the inside of the space to really engage our visitors in doing things, not just in seeing things. And one of the um, objectives for that building is to help people understand how innovation happens, what's the process that it takes to get from the question to the answer, from the idea to the creation, and to do it across all of the disciplines that the Smithsonian works in, so history, art, science, and culture. One of the differences about the experience in that space is that it will require us to think of things for people to do in there, that they can do with each other, that they can do with us, that they can learn from our collections in new ways. And so one of the ideas is to bring our 3D digitization lab, um, which is currently uh, out at Pensy Drive in Maryland, bring that into the space, allow our audiences to see uh, this technology at work, doing all of the things that you've heard about for the last two days, so scanning, um, creating creating three-dimensional images, creating replicas in certain instances, allowing people to really get a sense of what does that look like, to ask questions of the experts who are doing that work, and to ask questions of the scholars who understand the stories and the context behind those specimens and artifacts. Another opportunity it gives us is the challenge that Saul Griffith just leveled at us, which is to create a super fun and super engaging space um, that we can give people a chance to really get their hands on that technology and come up with their own ideas of what to do with it. We'd like to create a, a makerspace inside of that building um, to let people get uh, a chance to use some of the three-dimensional technology that um, you're familiar with, but frankly, most people in America are not, um, and do it in a way that really is sparking new ways of thinking, new invention, new innovation, new challenges to old, uh, solutions to old problems. Um, whatever they come up with, I think we're ready to kind of open the doors and, and let that fly and just see where it goes. So that's one of the ideas for the space. There's a number of other um, things that we're planning in there, including um, programs for young adults that are uh, bringing innovators in from around the world to, to do speaker programs and more engaging problem solving. We'll be using a lot of high technology sort of multimedia displays, which is a little bit of a different approach for the Smithsonian. But we'll be doing it all in a very flexible and prototype style so that as things change, um, as new innovations come, come along, we'll be able to keep up with that, hopefully, and continue to offer a new um, and exciting experience in there. So stay tuned for more information about that. We did actually just launch our website uh, last week, innovation.smithsonian.com. Um, this is a, an internal partnership with our digital media team at the Smithsonian Magazine, um, and that site, we hope, um, can share really interesting stories about innovations going on out in the world, going on here at the Smithsonian, and really be part of the experience that people have in the building. Instead of having a website that kind of runs alongside of and is very separate from the in-person experience, we want to experiment with some ways to really um, bring that online experience into the building and, and vice versa. So stay tuned um, on there for more updates about what we're planning and how you can be involved if you're interested in 3D technology. And now Saul has to promise us he'll send his kids <laughs> to kick the tires on this thing. That's right. We'll need to do some testing and evaluation. So you and all your kids are welcome. So the tremendously exciting thing about that is, in a way, it gives us an opportunity to solve our own problems in that space, but do it with other people and let other people solve their problems. Or if they don't have any problems, just <laughs> let it rip. And I think with that, this is the end of a tremendous two-day run. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for sharing this experience with us. It's been a great pleasure having you here. And uh, carry on and let us know what you're up to. And let's all go home and experiment and share with each other. Thank you. Thank you.